just as we went through before, if it's successful, we skip one rule, we come down to this PAM permit. And then we added on this optional rule of PAM SSH. And it has this argument of use first pass. So, you install this module on Debian. It takes your password, logs you in, and it feeds your Unix password to your SSH agent. And if your Unix password works to decrypt your keys, loads it in your agent. Debian assumes that your SSH passphrase is identical to your Unix password. And it will not prompt you. Um, Brian, I think a couple people need mints again. <laughs> so, and if you, I, I have followed, you know, Debian how-tos on FreeBSD and CentOS how-tos on Debian and, you know, Solaris how-tos on Sto. If you're, if you're doing, and most of the time I get away with it, if you're doing that with Pam, you will quickly be reduced to a screaming, gibbering maniac. Because the how-to just isn't working, what is wrong? And really the only way to identify this is to read the policy and understand it. This, of course, <laughs> leads to the perennial argument. The other guys suck. Now, I've been pretty open, I'm a BSD bigot. But, the people who build widely used distributions and operating systems are not idiots. They have different ideas of what things should do. That's why they built their own. So you're, you're in this position where you have to look at what they really did and what are they trying to achieve. <laughs> and again, this is un-American because, you know, the other guy is just always wrong. Um, <coughs> and so if you're using a how-to, from another operating system. <laughs> You'll just, things will quickly go bad, and eventually, you will wind up as one of these people. You don't want that. So, if you're playing in PAM, I know CentOS provides a tool so you never have to look at a PAM file. Debian provides a different tool so that you never have to look at a PAM file. Guess what? You have to look at the PAM file. There's no way around it. That behavior with the PAM SSH module was not documented in any of the man pages. And why should it be? It's an implementation detail of how that particular policy is written. Who cares about that? If you really want to know, you'll You'll read the PAM rules. Why, why should the module author care? And of course, the, the distribution packager doesn't really have a place to list that for this little used PAM module that's only applicable for your environment. And this is what drives people nuts with PAM. So, here's another PAM module that I'm fond of that I've used in different environments. Uh, I promise this is the last one that involves SSH. Uh, PAM SSH agent off. How many of you use an SSH agent? You can feed authentication requests from the local system back through to the agent. So for example, uh, I use it with sudo a lot. I never type a password for sudo. I never type a password on a remote system. Uh, it comes back. When I run sudo, it queries the agent. If I have the key, it authenticates. 
And this is kind of a, a crippled knockoff two-factor authentication. Uh, something you have is not really a file on your system. But it, it, it is good for certain use cases. FreeBSD, CentOS, and Debian all have it. Uh, your sudoers will need an environment keep statement to say keep my SSH authentication socket in the environment so I can find my SSH agent to query it. And then put in a, a sufficient statement in your PAM policy. If you want to use only SSH agent authentication, you make this first. If you want to use password and SSH agent, you might make this required. You might put this after your password check. Whatever fits your environment. Okay, how many of you, how many folks use Google Authenticator? Okay. Google Authenticator does not phone home to Google. Common misconception. It's an implementation of RFC 6238, much like it's used in those RSA tokens, for a time-based authentication. You can install an app on, say, your Android phone, or in your browser, or on your desktop, that generates the correct current code based on a secret that you have pre-configured with the server. Uh, it does require either correct time or synchronized incorrect time. <laughs> if you have decided that you are on daylight savings time all year round and you are not doing this stupid wake up an hour earlier in the spring, so long as your phone has the same time as your server, we're all good. And many other people have implemented this same functionality. If you don't like Google, there's one from Red Hat. There's one from any number of random people on the internet. Uh, FreeBSD comes with a module. Debian has a very old one. Uh, CentOS has one in EPEL. Sorry, CentOS 6 has one in EPEL. CentOS 7 doesn't have one. Wow. Red Hat again wrote their own. However, I've been in more than one organization where they say, no, this is our PAM module. You will use it. I have a, a separate rant on that topic. I can give if we have time. So, this should be familiar to all of you. Grab the code. Bootstrap, configure, make. Install your client program. And you want something with a QR code reader. Or you want something running locally, running in the same screen so you can copy and paste the really long code. Have some decisions to make with it. Uh, your timing features. Do you want to use each passcode once and only once? Uh, this RFC gives you a new code every 30 seconds. If you can use each password once and only once, you're limited to one authentication every 30 seconds. Um, this personally would drive me nuts because if there's something wrong on one of my systems, the first thing <coughs> I do is open 86 terminal windows into it. However, if you're in certain secure environments, if you must be, say, oath compliant, you get one code every 30 seconds. You can also play with uh, clock slop tolerance. Uh, some virtual machine systems have terrible clocks. I would like to think that, they're, that those systems are no longer in use, but we all know better. So you can increase the tolerance. And you can restrict to three attempts in each 30 seconds. 
So your user who wants to log in will run the program Google Authenticator. It'll ask a couple questions. If you're running a large environment, script this. It's very easy to script. You would think that a user should be able to type why, 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 and use their phone to take a picture of the QR code. They can't. <laughs> script it. Um, and then you plug it in. Uh, somewhere in the system. Now, do you put Google Authenticator in your system defaults? Well, do you want it to show up in FTP requests, in SU or sudo requests, uh, in simple login requests for the console? Think very carefully before you just say, this is our default. So it is 8.03. I have more time than I thought. So I'm going to add in a, a, a couple little uh, things I didn't think I'd have time in. Yes? Before you do that, going back to the debugging. Debugging, sure. It was, it was, I don't not that need to go back to that slide, but it would strike me in, in working with this sort of thing that it would be good to have the emergency escape patch when you're testing changes. I was wondering what the kind of works for you. Anytime you touch authentication, yes, you need an emergency escape patch. If you are debugging, if you are testing, if you are deploying, always have a terminal window open with root access. Mm -hmm. at least one window where you are already root and you can fix what you screwed up. <laughs> uh, anytime you go anywhere near any authentication system, have a privileged window. This is especially true on a system uh, like you go into where there is no root password, it's sudo or nothing. Mm. And I don't know about you, but I've broken sudo a lot. Any other questions? Yes, Bob? Uh, you mentioned the difficulty in handling the controls. Have you ever looked at SMTP address uh, manipulation? Yes, I have. Okay. Yes, don't do that. <laughs> I mean, don't look at it. Let the system do it, but no, you, no. I'm not writing that book, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, I'm gonna fall into a, and, into a couple other topics that I didn't think I was going to have time for. Um, let's start with Pam exec. This lets you run arbitrary commands as part of your authentication. And in short, what I'm going to say is, don't do that. When you, as sysadmins, we like shell scripts. We really do. Shell scripts save us so much trouble. And it would be really easy to think, well, the company wants me to authenticate users against a NoSQL database available over SunRPC through this SSH tunnel. I'll just write a shell script. We'll be done. When you do this with authentication, though, there are so many things that can go wrong. If you need shell script glue, try not to put it directly inside PAM, because if that breaks, you're really in a world of hurt. Third-party modules that someone else has written, even if it's by some random Yahoo on the internet that doesn't know that his module should accept a debug flag. At least one other person has already found some of the bugs with that. And if you write your own script, you're starting over. And I have seen PAM exec used successfully in deployment 
once. And it impressed the crap out of me. Um, and this script was about 400 lines of bin sh with all of the error handling, etc. Uh, most of the time, people think they can write a three-line shell script and be done. If, if you must write a shell script, remember you are opening up a great big project that is going to haunt you for the rest of your existence at that organization. And once you're gone, it, people will curse your name unless you don't put your name in the code. <laughs> Yes, you put your buddy's name in the code before you leave. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing I'm going to talk about is PAM and organization security policies. How many of you work in organizations or are, are sysadmins for organizations that have very specific security policies and sysadmin policies on this is how you run systems? I know at least one hand, yeah, there are lots of organizations where they have rules on how things should be done, which exact PAM modules should be used, and how they should be deployed. Systems administration is always changing. Uh, one example. That, that's near and dear to a lot of people. There's a PAM module called PAM Make Home Dear, which is used when you have, you're using an authentication system like LDAP. Suppose you have you know, 400, 1,000 machines, and your authentication information is all in LDAP, and most of these machines you've never logged into. But when the day comes you have to log in, PAM Make Home Dear, makes your home directory for you. So you can log in and you have a, a, a shell config and you're, you're at least able to do some things. I've been in, I've talked to people at more than one organization that says you will use PAM make home here. Well, Red Hat no longer supports PAM make home here. This is because it doesn't have the necessary SE Linux contexts. So, you've got a choice. Um, don't use Red Hat. Violate company security policy. Turn off SE Linux. Hmm. Either in whole or in that little piece of the policy. None of these are really great answers. Now, I will say disabling the PAM security policy for that module in SE Linux is not that hard to do. But still, if you're using Red Hat, Red Hat considers SE Linux a key part of their system. They've, they are building everything around SE Linux. So presumably, you want one of those, you, you want that core feature of your chosen OS. Um, or you've just been using Red Hat since forever and you turn off that stupid SE Linux crap. Uh, it's important if you come across something like this, uh, go back to your standards body, your security team, and talk to them about what's going on. Because the truth is, the security people don't know unless you tell them. And very frequently, a rule like, you will always use PAM make home dear, is a response to something. And often, it's a response to, oh my god, the sysadmins are using PAM exec for everything. We need to stop them somehow. Okay, we, we mandate this, and we mandate this, and we mandate this, and hopefully that solves the problem. Talk with your people. These things are solvable. It's, it is routine change.
okay, that ends the stuff I thought I didn't have time for. <laughs> Any other questions? Anything else? Come on, usually I show up here and you guys pepper with questions until like the library staff unleashes the hounds to get us out. So, so I, got, I got a question. Um, yes, sir. So uh, I use Google Authenticator. I was just thinking, um, do two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication. By default, when you install Google Authenticator, you, it asks you for your password. Oh, I'm using LDAP, by the way. So I'm using okay. LDAP. So it asks me for my LDAP, and then from there, uh, it asks me for the Google verification code. What I really want to do, though, is basically say, if this user is in a particular group, that's when I only want to use Google Authenticator. Because these okay. people are higher privilege level people, um, that type of deal. So I found that it kind of, it's not easy to do. Um, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I didn't know if you had any tips or any thoughts around that. Or... <sighs> okay. Uh, for the tape, since the, the microphone is facing me. Yes. Um, <laughs> He's using Google Authenticator and LDAP, and he wants to be able to say certain users must use certain methods. Uh, you have a few things to tie that together. What operating system are you using? Ubuntu in this case. Okay, you're using Ubuntu. I, this is exactly what things like uh, PAM Wheel to check group membership, and then the Linux PAM extended controls are for. You can say, if user is in this group, uh, or if user is not in this group, skip the next three lines. Mm, if user is not in this group, skip the next three lines. And then at the end, put a deny. It says, oh, you're not in any group that's allowed in. Get out. Gotcha. That, that is my first thought. Yeah, I think I was approaching this wrong. I, I tried to actually do it at the SSH level. And I actually put a actual, um, was it a, uh, it basically made a, it looked at a match. Basically. Match user, yes. Match user. And it wasn't doing what I want. So I think I'll go back to the default and do it that way. Yes. Um, match user in SSH is a wonderful thing. I love it. Uh, and, yeah, you you're using a, a hammer to drive a screw there. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, it, uh, I'm not really that heavy on this stuff, but if Pam has all these disadvantages and problems, as you've described tonight, is there just something else to use instead that just is so much better? Oh, uh, is there something else to use that is so much better? <laughs> The answer to the first half of that is yes. There are other things to use that are better. The answer, no. No, PAM is as good as it gets. No. Be and the reason PAM is complicated is because the real world is complicated. Okay. What works for Ford Motor Company is not going to work over at Chrysler, is not going to work at GM, is not going to work in my house or his test lab. Everybody wants to do something different. If we all wanted to do the same thing, we wouldn't need Pam. Um, and even, even something like OpenBSD, who has their own authentication system, BSD Auth, is in some extent pluggable. They let you call external programs that will return a, a limited range of codes to say yes or no, you may enter. So it's kind of PAM-ish, but it's not a shared library. And it's, it's not as randomly flexible as PAM is. Because e even the same module, we saw the PAM SSH between FreeBSD and FreeBSD and TB and uh, exact same module, totally different ways of using it. Yep. So, uh, can you tell us a little bit about, is there some idea of what the future is going to look like for PAM? 
what is we're going to see three years from now? Is this going to stagnate, or is it really in, still in development and people are working on this? Well, what is the future like for Pam? Dark. <laughs> the general Pam structure is set. We will be seeing the words sufficient and requisite for the rest of our careers. Now, people are doing innovative things with PAM modules. People are inventing new ways to authenticate every day. Uh, for example, while Red Hat doesn't support PAM Make Home Dear anymore, they wrote a new way to a new module that makes home directories that conforms with SE Linux. So they, they haven't gotten rid of that functionality. They've just created something new that works with their worldview. And whatever new authentication method comes up will almost certainly be configured through the existing PAM infrastructure. I'm sorry. Bob? Um, about a year ago, I had, I had to write a project for a licensing system. Uh, and it had similar evolution requirements. Uh, so I had to develop for it a context-sensitive uh, language. Okay. Now, in order to avoid the problem of no formal language, uh, okay, um, wrap that on top of a midterm uh, module. So uh, the midterm was well defined. You could uh, add, forget, it was very tolerant of uh, changes to the context sensitive uh, language on top of that, and had a detection algorithm. Uh, if you wrote bad rules, you would end up with a midterm uh, size that was astronomical. So it okay. was a good way to sometimes detect mistakes. Okay, is there anything similar for uh, Pam? Or if there isn't, why not? Well, and so is there any sort of context checker for Pam? Is yes. there the summary of yes, it? Yes, okay. there's some way to, uh, auto, uh, to avoid the biggest problems to... Uh, yes. It, there is a context checker for PAM. It is called your test environment. Now, before you complain, everybody in here has a test environment. And some of you are even lucky enough to have a separate environment to run production in. Uh, yes. So. And these days with PAM, generally speaking, PAM tests are very simple. You need a small virtual machine with your modules installed. Uh, if you have some sort of test suite or something to, to uh, test your authentication process, you aim it at that VM and go. Now, if you're doing something more sophisticated, if you have programmed your own module uh, and you need to do load testing to see if this module can handle your 10,000 concurrent users uh, and your 100 concurrent logons a second, that, that takes a whole different sort of test environment. But these days, there is no reason not to fire up a virtual machine do terrible things to your authentication, blow it away and reinstall when you've fouled things up irreparably. Um, now, of course, you know, some testing is more difficult than others, uh, especially if you're using PAM exec. Um, I have spoken with someone who was using, on a bet, had PAM exec use Firefox uh, and got it to work. <laughs> and that's a great reason for having testing in a virtual machine uh, that you will never let anywhere near any sort of reality. So, no, test on a system. And test your failure cases as well. 
it's real easy to say, oh, it works, everything is good. Mm -hmm. But what happens if the user screws up? Because they will. Sure. Jim? Uh, do you ever hear of anybody using PAM for authenticating web-based apps? Oh, do I ever hear of people using PAM for web-based apps? Yes. Really? You know, you've uh, read the documentation on, yeah, you, you've been around a while, you've read